Hello everyone, I'm Cody B, and today's video is one that I've wanted to make for quite some time. I began work on it a while back, but my vision of it has changed for the better, I'd say. I want to talk about the pre-sequel and why I hate this game. Now, I know hate is a very strong word, but I can't really think of any other way to describe my feelings for the game. It comes from one of my all-time favorite series of Borderlands, but that's actually kind of the reason I hate it, because in all fairness, the pre-sequel isn't a bad game necessarily, it's just a bad Borderlands game. So I've compiled a few reasons why I feel this way, and before we get into this, let me just say, if you do enjoy the pre-sequel, that's fine. This video is purely my opinion, but whether you agree or disagree, let me know in the comments, but let's get into this. I remember back when Borderlands the pre-sequel was announced. I was in high school and Borderlands 2 was the only game I would play when I got home from school. The community around the game was as strong as ever, with big names like Admiral Baru, Morning After Kill, Gathalion, and even Master Kids making Borderlands content regularly. I personally had a group of friends that I would play with, or even just go solo. There was no shortage of games that were just open to join and have fun playing at random parts of the story. It was a great time to be a fan of the series, and then suddenly Gearbox announces a new Borderlands game and everyone goes nuts with hype. This game looks incredible, it's gonna be like Borderlands 2 but in space and laser guns, we all thought. And well, I managed to scrape together enough money to pre-order and then purchase it for my Xbox 360, and then when the day came I immediately took Borderlands 2 out of my system and put in the pre-sequel. It was in my Xbox for about three days before I took it out and put Borderlands 2 back in because the pre-sequel wasn't Borderlands 2 in space and laser guns, it was the Walmart brand Borderlands in space and lasers, and I was very disappointed to say the least. Even the content creators for the game didn't seem as enthusiastic making videos about the game, it was just kind of okay and definitely failed to capture the magic that Borderlands 2 and even Borderlands 1 had. I feel the relationship between Borderlands 2 and the pre-sequel can be described perfectly with two guns found in both games, being the Unkempt Herald and the 88 Fragnum. As you can see on the surface, the guns look the same, very sleek and nice to look at, but then you start to use them a bit and you realize, oh, the 88 Fragnum is just slightly worse than the Unkept Herald in every single way. So now you're a little disappointed, but you think, okay, it's not as good, but it's still not bad. There's still plenty of fun to be had with this. So you begin to use it more, but then you also begin to realize just how much worse it is. And then you start getting frustrated, asking questions like, why is this so much worse? This should be better, or at least as good. Then in the end, your frustration grows into full anger, and you throw the 88 Fragnum into a lava pit for being offensively mediocre. But not really, because that actually took a long time to farm. But the point is, like the 88 Fragnum, the pre-sequel is just slightly worse than Borderlands 2, and there's really no reason for it. And to the hypothetical contrarian commenter in my head who says, the real reason the 88 Fragnum is worse than the Unkempt Herald is because the story of the pre-sequel takes place before Borderlands 2, so it's likely that it's an earlier version of the weapon, I say shut up, quit trying to ruin my comparison. In all seriousness, however, the pre-sequel does fall short in many ways, from the story to the bosses and even the guns. Although the story does have a few good moments, admittedly, and there are a few guns that are fun to use, but it really isn't enough to make the game good. So for the first topic, I'd like to discuss the story. As I said, it's not awful and it does have some good moments, but it really suffers from some big problems, mainly the pacing and the misuse of certain characters. Let's start with pacing. It's disgustingly bad. Too many times in the story you are forced to sit there doing nothing while characters go on and on about whatever the hell. Now this isn't so bad for a first playthrough because you're experiencing the story, but if you're going back through on True or Ultimate Vault Hunter, or even with a new character altogether, sitting there waiting gets really old really fast. However, it's not always just talking. Sometimes the game will have you doing random crap that just wastes time. The main part of the game that's prevalent is the tutorial section, which I say lasts from when you wake up on Helios until you finally get to leave Concordia. This entire section is just bad. Everything from getting loaded into the Moonshot Cannon, to waiting for Janie to walk all the way to you after picking up an Ozkit, to running around Concordia putting sensors on towers is just painful and totally kills the pacing of the game. Do you want to know how long in this section you are sitting there doing nothing or walking around doing errands for people? 25 minutes and 46 seconds. And that is just my time, as someone who's experienced with the game and knows where to go and what to do for everything. This is totally absurd. I get that it's a tutorial, but in a series where gameplay is the biggest attraction, there is no reason I'm spending almost a half hour doing nothing but waiting. Oh, and don't worry, this isn't the only part of the game that's like this. The entire game has sections that just bring the game to a screeching halt for no reason. And now yes, Borderlands 2, there were some sections where they slowed down the game and you had to sit through some story stuff, like the first time you get to Sanctuary is pretty AIDS every time, but overall it's not nearly as bad as the pre-sequel. In total, playing through the pre-sequel story in its entirety, you will spend 53 minutes and 58 seconds doing nothing. Let that just sink in for a second. You spend almost an hour doing absolutely nothing in a video game. Now, I do get it, you don't need to be shooting something 100% of the time, but this is just ridiculous, and honestly, this is the biggest reason why I don't like playing this game. It just makes for a boring experience. 
So moving on now to another big thing that bothered me. The misuse of characters, mainly regarding Moxie, Janie, Roland, and Lilith. Let's start with Moxie. She's completely pointless in this game. Like, there's actually no reason she's in the game other than, oh, she was in the rest of them and we gotta tell the players how hot she is. Now, you may be thinking, well, Cody, she actually played a huge role in the story, and yes, she did, but it didn't need to be her. Everything Moxie does could have been done by Janie, and not only done by her, but done better. Now, there are many reasons for this that I'll get into, but first, I want to ask, why is Moxie even on the moon? At the end of Borderlands 1, she has the Hollow Dome, she just helped topple Atlas by killing Nox, she's pretty well set up. Why would she randomly just decide to move to the moon and open up a bar? It just doesn't make any sense. But if we really needed Moxie in the game, her and Jack could have at least been dating. It would have made some of the things that happened in the story, like her betrayal, way more impactful than it already was. Also, side note, this could have created room for a nice little extra detail. See, the playable character Nisha flirts with Jack throughout the game. At first, before Jack fully descends into his twisted sense of righteousness, he could have blown her off, been like, I'm flattered, but I'm seeing someone. But as the game progresses, he starts to get crazier and crazier, and he starts to warm up to a bit and eventually fully embracing it when Moxie betrays him, and he fully slips into his madness. But of course, we don't get this. The closest thing we get is Janie hitting on Athena, which seems out of place and kind of awkward with how it's done in the game. But speaking of Janie, here's why she should have done everything Moxie does. See, when we meet Janie, she's shown to be a bit of a tech whiz, stranded out in the wasteland due to this guy stealing her Orbitron, which is like drugs for claptraps, I think. Oh, great! Yeah! Consider yourself totally cleared for decontamination. But it's neat to get into Concordia, and in the regular game, you get into Concordia and she just completely dips, literally saying that we're on our own now, and then we run into Moxie and we go through the towers and such. Personally, I think it would have been much better if Janie was the one that helped us out of Concordia. The sequence could have been almost exactly the same, but instead of Moxie randomly having this expansive knowledge of tech out of literally nowhere, the new character that was established to have this knowledge would be the one to do it. Janie's the biggest missed opportunity in this game. She could have been a real character, helping us along the way, finding the jamming signal, to helping us locate the military AI, to helping us on Helios. And then when she realized that Jack really isn't the good guy, betraying him and attempting to save the galaxy. She could have been a friend, or possibly a lover to the player character. Making her decision to betray Jack and likely kill that friend or lover, that much more difficult for her to make. Having her give a heartfelt apology to the player as the eye blows up would have been awesome to see. Then having a line from the player character giving their thoughts on the situation, everyone being angry I imagine except for Athena who would probably forgive her. The point is, a lot could have been done with Janie if they had used her right, but instead we just get a quirky mission vendor who's there for little more than a few one-liners and to introduce the weapon grinder. It's just a shame. So next I want to talk a little bit about Lilith and Roland. Their role in the game really isn't the issue honestly, although Lilith just teleporting into the vault to punch the vault symbol into Jack's face then just leaving is really stupid, but ultimately what they do makes a lot of sense and fits their characters. My problem is with how they seem to be dating in the pre-sequel, which makes no sense as we know from echo logs found in Borderlands 2 that they didn't start dating till after the fall of New Haven, which during the pre-sequel didn't happen yet because Jack hadn't gone all crazy. Now I suppose there's a possibility that they weren't dating yet, but like let's be honest, you don't take a vacation to the moon quote together just as homies. I mean at least I pray my man Roland isn't that far in the friend zone. Oh wait a minute, I'm sorry. The friend zone is an imaginary misogynistic way of looking at relationships, says Torg. I totally forgot. God, this game sucks. Anyway, moving on now to some more serious topics, I want to talk a little bit about some other characters that are presented, mainly Tiny Tina and Pickle. Both of them in this game are incredibly annoying. Tina's only in the game in TVHM and up, and chimes in while listening to Athena tell her story, and everything she says is just totally unnecessary and bad. Maybe I found her annoying because I'm not the biggest fan of her to begin with. I don't dislike her in Borderlands 2, and it really was cool to see her growing up in Borderlands 3, but she was just never really one of my favorite characters from the series like she was for so many other people. However, I feel like we all can agree that Pickle is just awful. His voice mainly, what he says even, seeing his face in the corner of my screen irritates me. Everything about him is just pure cancer. Now, I may be being a little bit harsh, but I mean, come on. Poor. Price is right. <laughs> Gordon, yeah. That's marvelous. Dry control panel. Flipping genius between a human and a talk. <laughs> that's quality software engineering for ya. You can't tell me that's enjoyable to listen to. So now I've gone over all the things with the characters and the story I wanted to talk about. There's just a few things left I want to discuss, being the weapons and the bosses. So in the pre-sequel, they added a new weapon type being the laser weapon. And honestly, they're pretty cool. You have several different options, from beam lasers to blasters and railguns, and even a shotgun laser, which is by far the worst one. But this was actually a good addition. 
For the most part, the laser guns feel really good, my personal favorite being the beam lasers, with several good unique ones like the Sub-Zero, Vibro Pulse, and the Rosie, although they nerf the Rosie to the point where it's pretty average because the developers don't like people having fun. There are a few other notable unique lasers like the Excalibur Bastard, and a few that are kind of bad, but that's fine, not every weapon will be top tier. However, the lasers are some of the only really new guns in the base game. They did add a few new guns in the Claptastic Voyage, some of which are actually really fun, but the vast majority of Legendaries are just Borderlands 2 Legendaries ported over, making many of them worse in the process. This is just lazy. They couldn't even make the guns look any different. Also, many of the unique blue guns in the game are super underwhelming, the Phrygia being the main one that's really good. This really detracts from the gunplay, as many of the unique guns aren't very fun to use. Now, as I said, the story DLC did add several fun guns to use, like the Sub-Zero and the Flare, and that's great, but I just wish that this much care had been put into the rest of the game. Another very important part of the Borderlands experience that the pre-sequel just gets kinda wrong is the bosses. The ones we encounter in the story range from bad to just forgettable. Flame Knuckle is so forgettable that I had to come back and add him after I finished the script. Deadlift is one that I would consider to be just bad. His fight is supposed to be really showing off the jump pads, but it just makes his fight a mess because he's constantly jumping around making him hard to actually hit. Red Billy isn't that bad of a fight, although it's not really anything special either. The Bosun has to be one of the most annoying enemies ever. His character just sucks and it's really fun to kill him, but the fight itself isn't that great. Felicity is the only fight in the game I can say I really enjoyed. The weight behind it from the story really adds a lot. Zarpadon isn't an awful fight, it's in two phases and neither one is really offensively bad. The Kempjet is an awful fight. The damn thing flies around constantly, making it difficult to hit. Flying enemies always suck. The only reason the bunker in Borderlands 2 worked is because it would stop and let you land hits, so the fight didn't drag on forever like this one does. Also, side note for this fight, it isn't even necessary. The player character even says, I can just avoid it, but Jack is like, no, sit through this crappy boss fight because getting stabbed in the back or something. And finally, we have the Sentinel and the Imperian Sentinel. I'm clumping these two together because they happen one right after another. But these fights are just bad as well. They take entirely too long as each has multiple phases, which are all just the same thing with different elemental damage. And I mean, the idea for the fight isn't bad, it's just how it's executed. And lastly, let's talk about the raid boss. Remember back in Borderlands 2 when you encountered Terramorphous for the first time? Yeah, it was pretty awesome, right? Well, guess what they did to top that in the pre-sequel? You know that final boss with the Sentinels that you didn't enjoy so much? Yeah, well you get to experience the exact same fight again, but harder because the developers are lazy and seemingly tried everything in their power to make this game as average as possible. The point is, the bosses in this game are super underwhelming, and that's very unfortunate. I feel like some care went into some of these fights, but they just weren't executed very well. There are a few mini-bosses as well that are actually pretty good, like Irujira and Meg, but these really aren't enough to support the whole game. So the last thing I want to talk about is actually a bit of positivity, and that's being the side missions. Don't get me wrong, many of these suck as well, but I found myself having most of my enjoyment in the game with the side missions. Some just have a great little story, like sub-level 13, even though Pickle's involved with that one. Although you can screw them over and get a cool gun for doing it, so that's cool. There are also just some fun little gameplay sections, like the Voyage of Captain Chef, where you help him claim the moon in the name of King Greg. Or there are just these missions that are in the area that you're already headed to, like Follow Your Heart, that just give a nice little reward for doing it. Ultimately, these made the game bearable, and I actually found myself having a good time playing them, but just like everything else in this game that it does right, it's just a little bit too little, too late, unfortunately. So in conclusion, it's clear that Borderlands the pre-sequel is the black sheep of the franchise. It had a ton of potential, but it just fell a little short for whatever reason. I truly wish the game was better, but unfortunately we don't live in that reality. But there is one thing that I need to say for the game, and that is that it is worth playing at least one time, even if you're just a casual fan of the series, because the story is pretty great for what it is, and the act of killing bandits and various creatures of the game is as fun as ever. I just don't recommend getting all the characters up to max level, even though the characters of the game are all pretty fun, this game just has the worst leveling process by far. And if you really do want to experience all of the characters, I would just recommend stopping at 50, because getting up to 70 just takes entirely too long. That's all I really had to say on the pre-sequel. Feel free to let me know what you think in the comments if you wish, but I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you all in the next one very soon. Peace out, and have a great day.